Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jessica Rockhold, and I'm the Executive Director of the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. Welcome to our first ever public Zoom of a second generation speaker. We haven't done this before. We did do it with teachers earlier in the week. But they're our most forgiving audience, and we like to try things with them sometimes. Um, a few housekeeping notes for those of you that maybe aren't Zoom professionals yet. In the upper right hand corner of your black Zoom box, there's two different ways that you can view this. One is in speaker view and the other is in grid view. We recommend that you click on speaker view so that when Jerry starts to talk, she'll be the biggest picture in your window. Because of background noise, we do have everybody muted and if you could keep your, keep your mute on, we would appreciate that. On the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat feature. And if you could write any questions that you have for Jerry along the way in the chat, I'll moderate those back to her. We are a big enough group that we think that probably asking them out loud won't work very well for us tonight. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Jerry to you. Uh, Jerry and I met about 18 months ago, we just decided. It was uh, a fall and a half ago. And she came to me and she said, because of my work schedule, I, I can't physically go, but I wanna speak. I do this presentation on Zoom. And at the time I thought, I don't know a whole lot about Zoom. And it turns out that a lot of people didn't know a whole lot about Zoom. And in the last five weeks, the whole world has caught up to Jerry. So we are all now uh, trying to adjust to this. And the good news is that we can still take advantage of this technology and still hear these very important messages. This month marks the 75th anniversary of the primary batch of liberations, the ones that happened in Germany and Austria. There were liberations that happened earlier, but by and large, it was an April and a May spring 1945 event. So this is the anniversary of our survivors being liberated. And it is also, I think, a very important time for us to be gathering and continuing to share these memories and these stories. As you know, in times of distress, in times of crisis, we often see increased bigotry, and often that takes the specific form of anti-Semitism. And addressing the Holocaust and the extreme form of anti-Semitism and bigotry that that represented is um, particularly important during these times. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Jerry. I'm gonna mute myself now and listen to her, and I will be keeping an eye on the chat for your questions. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, before I get started, I wanted to really thank um, the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education here in Overland Park, Kansas, um, specifically Jessica Rockhold and Shelley Klein for helping to provide me this opportunity to share my mother's story with you. So thank you to the Midwest Center. I also want to thank you, each and every one of you, for taking time out of your days or evenings in this case. Um, these are unusual times that we find ourselves in, but I've seen such innovation um, during this time and, um, and such resilience. Uh, I wanted to share just a super brief story with you before I get started. My sisters um, helped to run a similar second generation group um, through the Holocaust Center in Oregon. And um, they too have moved online and it's wonderful to spend um, some time online with the survivors and the second generation and third generations who participate in, in those Zoom meetings. And as many of us do, when we first come on, we ask people, how are you doing at home? How are you doing during this time period? These are challenging times, how are you doing? And I just love the survivor's response who said, ah, this is no Holocaust. It's pretty easy by comparison, sheltering at home. So just a little bit of a current day con context. Um, for those of you who do not know about my mother or her story, but who might have read Night by Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel was from Siget, Romania, 
And that is the same town that my mother was from. In fact, when my mother used to go around and speak at schools, she often got the question from students, did you know Ellie? Did you know Ellie Wiesel when you were back home? And my mom would say, Ellie? Yeah, he's just a scrawny little brother of a girlfriend of mine. And, um, you know, fast forward many years, he became a Nobel laureate. But um, what's very interesting to me is to read his stories and then my mother's story. And there are some uh, interesting differences in perspective over the same events that might have happened. So it was, um, it's, it's really a unique opportunity for me to share uh, my mom's story with you. So she was born in 1923, and she lived in this town of Siget that they often called the Little Paris because it was um, not a large population, but it was it was very, um, she used the word fancy. It was a very nice, nice town. And there were nice people, all kinds of people who lived in Siget. Um, the Jewish people um, at that time were not allowed to own land. And so many of them were professionals, doctors, lawyers, bankers. Her father owned a small deli kind of an import shop where you could sell uh, different meats and cheese and that kind of thing. One thing that um, I've learned is fairly unique about his shop was that he lent space to the gypsies who lived in town. And uh, just from what I could gather from my mother, I don't think that everybody was as friendly to the gypsies as they were. Um, in fact, today I make a certain kind of a soup that I thought was a traditional Jewish soup. And one of my sisters learned um, only a few years ago, no, that's not a Jewish recipe, it's a gypsy recipe. So that gives you an idea of how friendly um, my mother's parents were with the gypsies uh, population there in Siget, Romania. The town, I had the fortune to visit um, uh, 50 years after my mother's liberation. She wanted to go back for the first time and to revisit the concentration camps where she was in. And uh, she showed us the town and she showed us her house, um, which was beautiful. Um, her house, uh, my favorite room in her house was the living room, which they called the salon. It had a curved ceiling uh, in the living room. It wasn't just, uh, you know, sharp corners. It was curved and beautifully painted. And that's where she used to have her uh, grand piano um, in there. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, in the downtown, there was this beautiful theater building. Um, I say downtown, but even today, there are not large, tall buildings. Um, or a downtown like we would think of in a, in a typical American city. But there was definitely a center of town and it had a beautiful um, um, grass area that led up to a large theater. And that was really a gathering spot for um, my mother, her family, her friends uh, when she lived there. These things will um, come up during um, the story when I tell you more about her experiences, but I wanted to give you a little preview now. So she was already, she had been going to school in, um, in Siget. She also took piano lessons and she was fortunate to take private English lessons. Uh, she loved to dance, she loved music, and she had many friends. And in the evenings, um, because they did not have internet, they did not have um, telephones that, that teenagers would hang out on and talk, instead they would meet in person after dinner. And my mother would often get dressed up, put on a, some nice clothing, um, because as the way she put it, you never know who you are going to see or who is going to see you. 
And at that age, her teenage girlfriends um, and her, they always had their favorite boys picked out and they were hoping that they would pass them on the sidewalks at night, stop and chat for a while. And she loved that. That was, she just was a very happy, um, a happy girl, happy family. And um, I would say um, that from what I can gather, it sounded like her parents um, protected her in the sense that she didn't really realize that times were getting bad or that, that even once the war started, that there was even a war going on. She was able to go to school for many years um, during um, the beginning of, uh, through most of the years of the war. If you know um, about some of the Holocaust history, it was the um, Hungarian, um, through the Hungarian experience, they really, um, some were brought earlier in uh, labor, to labor camps, but really the um, transport to the concentration camps for the Hungarians didn't happen until later in the war. And that was her experience. Now, she was born in Romania, Siget is in Romania, but it was close to the Hungarian borders. So depending upon the political winds of the time, sometimes she spoke Hungarian in school, sometimes they spoke Romanian in school, but she spoke both languages, but Hungarian was her primary language, even though she lived in Romania. At home, they spoke Yiddish, and she learned a little bit of Hebrew going to synagogue. So things were going along just fine. She had a beautiful, lovely life. Um, and then things started to change. And she noticed certain rules were starting to come about. Not a lot at first, but occasionally a, a rule would come out. And everybody would say, what? What? How, how could that be? But they were law abiding and they said, okay, we don't understand, but we'll go along with it. And then another one and another one. And I'll give you some examples. So there was this law, this new rule that came out that said Jewish girls couldn't be educated anymore. They couldn't go to school. And of course she was horrified at first because that's where she saw her friends, that's where she was learning, she liked her teachers, but the way she described herself was, well, I wasn't the best student, so okay, if I have to not go to school anymore, okay, I'll stay home and practice my piano and get together with my friends after, uh, after school. But then time went on and another rule came that said that Jewish uh, people could no longer own a business. They had to close their shops. And that was a hard one because her father, of course, was their major breadwinner of the family and he could no longer work. And he eventually had a heart attack and died. So now it was my mother, her mother, and um, their grandmother living in the same roof her aunt Sarah, Auntie Sarah, and her two little kids, and her husband lived close by. So it was, that was the nuclear family. My mother had two older brothers, but one of them was already studying medicine at the Sorbonne in Paris. So that was tough, but what do you do? You keep on going. Another time a rule came out that said, Jews can no longer walk on the sidewalk. Well, that was a problem for these wonderful walks that my mom and her girlfriends would take in the evenings because they used to dress up. But back then um, they did a lot of their deliveries through town um, with horse and cart. And so where there are horses, there's a mess in the street. And she did not want to walk in the street. She did not want to get her nice shoes messed up. And so she stopped going on those nightly walks. 
books as well. Another rule came that said, all of the people who live in this part of the town, the Jewish people who live in this part of the town, you have to pick up and move into this part of the town. My mom's house was in this part of the town, so people started moving into their part of the town. And you were not free to come and go from that part of the town. They called it ghetto. That was the ghetto, and you couldn't move in and out if you were Jewish. And some families moved into her house. She didn't know them. It was very awkward, but what do you do? She thought one day she would go in and practice her piano in that beautiful living room. She opened the door and there was a family in there and they had stacked pots and pans on top of her piano. And she said, oh, forget it. She closed the door and never practiced her piano again in that room. And they just waited. What do you do? It was during this time that um, the boys and the men uh, were taken. And her brother uh, was taken during this time. And Ellie Wiesel writes about this, and my mom talked about it as well. There was one time when one of the boys somehow came back to town, and he said, you are not going to believe this, that they took us and they lined us up against a huge, alongside a huge pit, and they shot at us in our backs, and most people fell in. They died. And somehow this boy managed to not get shot, and he managed to escape, and he came back to town, and he told them this. And you know what? The people didn't believe him. When he said, you're never going to believe, they didn't believe them, because this was unheard of. This was a very different time. They didn't have such violence, at least not talked about, not on the news, not the, in their town, certainly not in her own family. They never talked about things like shooting and guns and this kind of thing. And plus, these boys and men had done nothing wrong. Why would somebody just shoot them in mass like this? So time went on. And one day, a very loud knock came on the, their, the gates to their, to their front entryway. And a soldier was yelling. And he said, you have five minutes. You have to get out and line up in the street. Well, they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know how long they were going to be gone. They didn't know what to bring. Should you bring a suitcase? Should you bring your valuables? Are we coming back? I mean, think about it. What would you take? You have no idea where you're going, whether you'll be back, what the weather will be like, how long you'll be gone. What would you bring? It's hard to think about. The only thing that they brought was my mother's grandmother had just finished baking a loaf of bread um, and so they brought that, that bread with them. At that time, my mother's Auntie Sarah was sick. She was in the hospital. And so they, my mom and her mom were taking care of the two little cousins. So my mom, her mom, the two little cousins, and Granny, my mom's grandmother, got out and lined up with everybody else. My mom used to talk about how sad everybody looked in this line because at that point, the men and the boys were gone. The only ones left were elderly and young and then the women and the girls. And they started walking them through town. And my mom would remember all of her wonderful memories of this church or walking by that shop or this neighbor's house as they are walking through now this time very sad and and not knowing where they were going well um the the people who were making them walk were were yelling angrily and giving them orders 
and rushed them on their way on this walk and where they ended up was the train station. And my mom used to take train rides with her mother back in the day and that was a wonderful experience. The trains were kind of fancy back then. You dressed up if you were going to Budapest or someplace um, on a vacation. And this was not that kind of an experience this day. Instead of uh, passenger cars, there were cattle cars. And they were very high up to get to, uh, to get into the entrance, to, to enter it. So they had to climb up into these cattle cars and they just squeezed in a lot of people. They squeezed them in and there were no chairs inside. They were, um, they had, you know, the smell of cattle still in there. No chairs, no windows except a tiny little slit of a window up in the, in the top part of one of in some of the, the walls. Um, and they closed the doors. They crammed all these people in, they closed the doors. These people didn't know where they were going. And for three days and two nights, the train just rolled on and on and on and on. That, that um, loaf of bread that they had brought with them, the two little cousins ate that and, and it was gone. My mom didn't eat anything. You, you, there was no um, bathroom facility. Somehow there was a bucket on there and if somebody needed to go to the bathroom, they, someone else would just hold a blanket or a coat up for some semblance of privacy. But um, during that hard train ride, two nights, three days, Several of the older people, some of the older people died during that trip. And on that third day, the train stopped and the doors opened up and it was very bright and sunny. My mom said it was really hard to see, but she heard somebody say, um, you have just arrived to Auschwitz. Um, this is a labor camp. And so my mom thought, because by then now she was already um, 22 years old. I would say a naive 22. I don't think she had ever worked before. She hadn't, but she heard those words and she said, well, if this is a labor camp, if I have to work, I'm going to work. And so um, she jumped off of that high cattle car down onto the um, side of the tracks and everybody else came out and they lined them up in these long lines and she was there with her mother and the two little cousins in between them and they were walking down this long line huge long line of people coming in both directions from long long lines of train cars toward the center point where there was this um a platform, a wooden platform with a, with a deck up there where one man was standing. And she looked at him and he was very, she said, very handsome in his uniform. And she thought, well, if somebody's that handsome, they can't be mean. So she was um, just going along with everyone else. They approached this platform and this man, it, what didn't say a word, he was just pointing. You go in that direction, you go in that direction, you go to the right, you go to the left, without saying words. Well, he pointed to my mother to go to her right. And then he pointed to her mom and the two little cousins to go to the left. Well, she didn't want to separate from them, so she started to go to her left with them. And as soldier came at her with a gun, with a bayonet, the point on the end almost stabbed her because she dared to disobey this man up here. And we found out later that this man was the infamous uh, Dr. Mengele. So she went to her right, her mother and the two little cousins went to their left, and she never saw them again. She was taken with a lot of the other girls her age and from her town into a barrack 
and they took their clothes and exchanged them for a very rough burlap like material dress, ugly, but they all look the same, these rough material dresses, and they shaved their hair. My mom had long brown curls that was very pretty, and she said she looked down and there were her curls on the floor, but she said, oh well, um, I'll grow more. And she went with that group of girls. They were then taken to a barrack with um, it was a wooden barrack. There was nothing inside except wooden bunk bed beds, no blankets, no pillows. They just were these wooden structures. And they all went inside. And a woman who was in charge um, started to yell at them. And she was um, saying, Things like, while well, you guys were safe and warm in your beds at home, I have been here for years building up this place, building these buildings. And, and she was just very angry, very, very angry. And then one of the girls in my mom's group said, excuse me, but do you have a brother named David? And she stopped and she said, why, yes. I do. Why do you ask? And the girl said, well, when the um, military went through our town, David was among them and he was so nice. We um, opened our house to um, provide lodging for the troops that were coming through and David stayed with us and, and he was a very nice man. Apparently he must have looked like her. I don't know how this woman made the connection, but from that point forward, this woman who was in charge of their barrack, she was called the Blokova, she, um, she really softened and she began to protect them. And my mother used to describe her as their guardian angel. When the knock would come in the morning from the soldiers to say, it's time for these girls to go to work, the Blokova, she said, no, not these girls. They are sick and under quarantine. They can't go. And this worked for quite some time. Um, at one point, though, they came and they said, no longer can these girls no longer work. They have to go to work. So my mother's job, with, along with her um, girls who were in the same barrack, what they had to do is they had to walk a long way across, um, this was Birkenau, which was the women's camp of Auschwitz. Um, they had to walk down these dirt paths that were lined by electrical barbed wire fences. And they had to walk a, quite a long ways to get to the building where they worked. And as time went on and the women were just underfed and malnourished and losing weight and so in such despair, my mother said, truly, some girls did on purpose touch the electrical barbed wire fences and they were killed instantly. Um, but she was very careful to walk in between these fences, not touch them and, and go to their work. And what her job was, um, along with her girl, her, 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 um, girls who were from her uh, barrack were to take scissors and they were dull so it hurt their hands but still they had to cut fabric and this fabric was you remember at the beginning where they had to take their clothes and have it exchanged for that dress well they had gathered everybody's clothing and brought it to this one building and there was just mountains of clothing and her job was to cut through the clothing and cut through um, the fabric to make strips that they then braided, strips of fabric, they braid together and roll it up into a ball. And they were told that that ball became um, the fuse for um, the German military for their, for their war effort. So here she was cutting along and every now and then they would come across items that people had either hidden in their pockets or sewn into the seams of their clothing. And at one point she found a little silver spoon um, and she 
she kept it. She decided to keep it. She hid it. If she would have been caught with it, I don't know what would have happened, but she somehow managed to hold on to this little silver spoon that caught her eye. One day, shortly after they began working, one of her girlfriends started to scream and cry. And then they said, what is the matter? And she said, these are Giza's clothing. And that Giza was their block of a, their guardian angel. She had been found out that she had been protecting these girls for so long that she herself was killed. And those were her clothing. So the days went on. In addition to working, they had to be called for roll call several times a day. You couldn't just be free to go about whenever you wanted. You couldn't go to the bathroom anytime you wanted to. You had to wait for these groups. They did things in groups. They were, they were under tight control. And only after there were several groups, uh, uh, several girls together who needed to go to the bathroom in a group, they would take them to the, to the bathhouse, uh, to the bathrooms. Um, I visited there when we went back with my mother in 1995, and it was not a nice building. There was um, a long slab of cement with holes cut in it, and the holes were where you sat on the edge of the hole and went to the bathroom, and as you were sitting on this slab of cement, it went down in there. And on the wall, there was a black paint lettering, German lettering that in translation said, um, you know, the equivalent of, you know, shut up, you know, you keep quiet, but, but in, a, in a mean way. Um, and she was told, all the girls were told, if you should ever be sick, um, it, like if you had diarrhea or something like that in these bathhouses, don't tell anybody if you're ever sick. Don't ever get too skinny because what will happen is you will be selected and you will be taken and we'll never see you again. You will go up in smoke. And she pointed to this building that had a tall, tall, tall chimney constantly smoking. And the girls had seen this building. They had seen the smoke. They never really gave it much thought. And when this, they were told, don't you ever be sick, you're going to end up in the smoke, they didn't know what that meant. This was un unprecedented, unheard of. How could, what? How would you get into smoke? So, but they got the message that you were not supposed to tell anybody if you were sick or if you got too skinny. And my mom was in danger because she was petite to begin with. Um, those of you who know me, I am... 5'1 on a good day, um, and I was taller than my mom. So she is a petite woman, and without much food, um, she started to get very skinny, and it was dangerous. So on one of these um, many times where they would call for roll call, and they'd have to stand up and stand five abreast in a line and be counted, um, uh, she was, she knew she was, she, she knew she was at, uh, in danger. And one of those times they said, now this is a selection. So, oops, now she knew here it was. And she, um, had an idea. So what happened with these selections, there were two soldiers sitting apart from one another and the girls had to take their dress off and walk naked in between these two soldiers so that they could check to see how skinny they're getting, they had sores anywhere, that kind of thing. And if they passed inspection, they could stay and work. And if they did not pack, pass, they were selected and never seen again. My mom knew she was so skinny that um, she was in danger. So she had an idea. And she used to say that you would not believe what your mind can come up with if you have the sense that you are, your life is in danger. And she had this idea. There were these two girls, they were twins, they were sisters, who had recently arrived to the camp. 
So they weren't very skinny. In fact, they were quite um, shapely still. And my mom had the idea that maybe if she sneaks between them, the soldiers won't look at her skinny body and they'll just be distracted by these um, nice looking naked women. And so she asked the sisters, um, excuse me, can I squeeze in between you and go in between you guys? And they said, sure. So the first sister walked across and the soldiers indeed were eyeing her up and down and while they were doing that my mom with her little skinny legs snuck through just when the second sister the twin started to walk through and they were turning their attention to watch these shapely women walk across and she she was able to uh, save her life in that moment another time she described going to the bathhouse now this time it was a place where um, it's a large cement room where they would put all of the girls in the barrack in there and um, there were a few shower heads and some water would come out, sprinkle out. Occasionally they would give them some soap and my mom said it, it was nice. It felt good to get a little bit clean. And one of the times they were in the bathhouse and the water didn't come out and they waited and they waited and there was no water that came out. And one of the girls started to cry and cry and, 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 and really sob. And the other girl said, what are you crying about? What, what's the issue? And the girl said, I heard that sometimes water doesn't come out, but gas does. And it kills everybody. And now the girls were scared. So they all pulled to the side of this cement room and they were all crying. And this man came down the stairwell and opened up the door and said, what are you crying about? And they, one girl said, we don't want to take a shower today. And he left and he came back and he gave them their dresses back. And they got dressed and they were able to go back to their barracks. And many years later, when we were there uh, visiting with my mother, uh, we also met with a historian and she relayed this story to him. And he said, yeah, they, they knew that um, the Nazis were actually somewhat superstitious and also knew that if somebody knew that they were about to be killed, that their the potential to do whatever it takes to save your own life could lead to an uprising. And they knew, the Nazis knew that they were outnumbered, far outnumbered um, by the prisoners who were being held there. And they did not want a, a disruption like that. So that could be why they decided to release the girls and send them back. My mother remembers um, others uh, others recall this episode too. They call it the night the gypsies were murdered. Gypsies were also um, one of the targeted groups by the Nazis and there was a section in uh, the concentration camp where the gypsies were being um, held and they did um, attempt uh, uh, some kind of an uprising and they were killed and she remembers the screams and the shooting sound of that uh, night which was sad because she, you know, had those ties to, uh, to fond memories of, of gypsies in her hometown. So time went on. Now it was winter and there was an order to get up and line up. And the, the order was that we are going to leave Auschwitz concentration camp. And there they started to walk. Some of the, they did not have winter clothes. Again, just this, this rough material dress and shoes. And my mom still had some soles left to her shoes. Many of the girls didn't. And they left the gates of Auschwitz and they started to walk through farmland and uh, they passed by farmhouses. And they walked on, uh, on, a, on a 
dirt road and there was snow um, on either side and they were told if you can't keep up you will be shot and my mom being very skinny at that point knew she was again in danger so she would try to run up to the front of the line and then kind of allow herself to rest a little bit before she fell back closer to the end of the line then she would run up again and, and they did that she did that um, many times until they got to the railroad tracks. Again, cattle cars, but this time they were open. There was no ceiling on them. And they crammed all the girls in and, um, and it started to roll. Now this walk on that uh, out of Auschwitz and onto these cars was what we now call the death march. So it was the same experience that Anne Frank and her sister Margot and Corey Ten Boom and others um, were on were on that death march, and um, the the train started. And again, a three day, two night, the trains were rolling, rolling, rolling. And one of those mornings, my mother woke up, and she shook her head, and snow fell off. It had snowed during the night. And you remember that little silver spoon that she held on to? She took that spoon and she started to scoop the snow off of her and eat it. And she said it was very refreshing. It gave her a little bit of water. And she said, I always knew you weren't supposed to eat yellow snow, but you could eat, you know, this clean snow a little bit. And so she um she she said that it felt good the train went into deep into germany and it stopped at another camp this one was called bergen belsen and there the girls were put into barracks again but this time they um weren't given food or water um, when we talked with the historian on site there, uh, when we visited 50 years after her liberation, um, he said, the question for the Nazis at that time was, they knew they were losing the war. They knew that the Allies were encroaching, coming in on them. They did not want to leave evidence of what they had been doing in these camps. The question was, how do you kill a large number of people um, at this camp, which was not designed to be a killing camp? So there were no gas chambers. There were no crematoria. How do you kill that number of people? And what they decided to do was a mass starvation. So they stopped feeding them and giving them water and um, the facilities were, it was just unhygienic. The girls started to have lice. My mom said it was just itchy to feel those lice in her head. And, um, and they were getting very, very skinny and malnourished. Um, occasionally they would throw uh, something like a turnip um, into her barrack that the girls were supposed to take a bite and a share. And she said, it got to the point where due to her malnutrition, her teeth were just wobbling in her gums. They were just so loose, she couldn't even bite into that anymore. So forget it. And people were dying a lot. And they would drag the bodies out um, at first and stack them outside of the, uh, the window but the pile became so high that it blocked the window and they just couldn't do it anymore. So people were dying and they just stayed where they died inside the barrack. And it was one of those times that my mother closed her eyes and started to take a nap. And she said it was very peaceful, very dark, very peaceful, nothing hurt. She was aware of the peacefulness and she said to herself, I wonder if this is what it feels like to die. And no sooner 
loud noises, yelling and running and people shooting and tanks. She heard these sounds and she thought to herself, who dares to wake me from this peaceful sleep that I'm having here? But she opened her eyes and just then the door opened and a man with a green beret, a, a cloth um, cap, peeked his head in and then he looked around and closed the door and left. But he came back and he spoke English. And do you remember she had English lessons when she was at home? So she at least recognized that, uh, that this wasn't business as usual. These were English speaking. And the man came over and lifted her head. She could not walk at this point. Lifted her head and gave her a sip out of the thermos and it was hot chocolate. My mother loved chocolate. So this act of kindness was something that she had not seen in almost an entire year. This was now April of 1945 and they informed them that uh, the war is over, the Germans are lost, you are liberated. So, um, in the following days, um, they asked my mother where she wanted to go. And she said, I want to go home, of course. And her girlfriend said, um, Alice, look at yourself. You can't even stand. You need to go to a hospital and get well first before you can go back home. And that's what they did. There were ambulance drivers. Um, they were uh, members of the American Field Service, AFS, ambulance drivers who were there alongside with the British who liberated Bergen-Belsen and then the Americans came, I believe about a week later. And they put her in ambulances. They took her to Sweden where they had converted schools into makeshift hospitals. And my mother said the Swedish people were so kind and so nice. And she was there until she could be well enough to move to another rehabilitation um, place where there were about a hundred girls who were rehabilitating there. She, it took her a long time before she could even walk again. Um, I know they did not know so much at that time about um, medicine and returning a body to health after extreme starvation. And she credits herself in part for her recovery because she was a very picky eater. So she did not eat very much. And even still, she was very picky about what she ate. So I think her system was able to come back online, so to speak. What got her out of bed and walking eventually was that if she was lying in her bed at a certain angle, she could look down the the hallway of her door was open. She could look down the hallway into another room where she could see a piano. And it was that piano, that motivation to play piano that got her out of bed and walking um, down there. Eventually, um, they allowed one man to come in. He was a photographer and he was Jewish. And they were, there was a, a vast effort to try to reunite families who had now separated all over Europe and even um, other countries. And one way was to take photographs and then try and um, match people, uh, families back together again. And it was on one of those evenings that um, this man asked my mother to go for a walk in the garden. She was walking by then and um, of course grew her beautiful curls back. And um, the problem was she spoke Hungarian and he was from Austria, so he spoke German. But my mom had a friend who spoke both languages. So with the friend in the middle, they would go on these nightly walks. And it was on one of those walks where he said to my mother, well, he said to the woman to tell my mother, yeah, I could spend the rest of my life with her. And my mother replied through the translator to him, yeah, I could spend the rest of my life with him too. And, um, and they got married. <laughs> and they lived in Sweden for two years before emigrating to the United States. My mother was told that 
Um, she would never be able to have children because of the severe malnutrition and some other physical um, ailments that uh, she suffered as a result of uh, being there in, in that condition um, for so long in the concentration camps. But she not only had a child, she had four, and she had four girls, and I'm the youngest of four. And so um, my mother would say, that's her revenge. You know, she went on to live a very happy, um, wonderful life and had four daughters who went on to have our own children. And this is what um, Hitler, you know, did not want, was uh, to, have, to have Jews in the world. So this was her, uh, what she called her happy revenge. So Jessica, I think I will stop here um, and see if uh, anybody has any questions. They have not been typing, so we'll give them a second here. Yeah, please, if anybody has any questions, either about my mother's story or anything about um, her life afterward or... Um, Maybe while we wait, you could show them the book? Yeah, sure. I typed in the chat, um, my sisters and I put together a modest website. In fact, we had our first family meeting during this COVID stay at home time to talk about updating my mother's website. It's just www.alicekern.com. But the reason we did that was because our mom um, wrote a book and um, uh, we were all adults when the book came out. And we thought, well, after she passed away, let's have this um, website where, where other teachers could, could find um, resources. So my mother spoke endlessly once the book was published at schools and churches and book clubs and libraries, anywhere who would ask her. She never said no. And I, I know this is low tech, but I'm just gonna show you the cover of the book. It's called Tapestry of Hope. She never went through a large bookseller. Um, there are some copies available through our website, or I've even seen some used copies available online. And Tapestry of Hope by Alice Curran. And while I'm doing that, I'm just gonna have to show you my favorite picture of my mom when she was um, in grade school and she loved dancing. And she was the Red Rose on the school play. And I just think this is so fitting because um, she and my father ended up in Portland, Oregon. And Portland is known as the City of Roses. I've had a couple of questions. One, okay. how did your parents get to the United States? Um, how did they get to the United States? Well, by boat um, back then. But what happened was the United States was not um, allowing just anybody to come in. There was, there was a quota um, and only certain cities. So I guess today we would call it a sanctuary city. I don't know how they decided who, how they decided which cities would take um, immigrants. But uh, my parents um, ended up um, in the Pacific Northwest because my father, who I didn't go through his story, but he is a survivor of Dachau. And he and his uh, older brother, his older brother had emigrated a couple of years prior and um, they ended up in the Portland area. So when it was time for my parents to emigrate, uh, they, they, they were sponsored by my dad's brother. We have a question about the nationality of the Blockaba. Was she German or Jewish? Yeah, that's a good question. I think she was um, Jewish. I think she was Jewish. She was not German. My, and I'd have to ask my sisters this. I may be Polish um, because they were close to the border there. And that actually brings up a good point. Um, you know, if you do study the Holocaust or Holocaust history, um, in these concentration camps, there were very few Nazis present, actually. It was that they put 
um, other Jewish people in charge or other inmates in charge. And um, I know this was the case with, um, this is a very strange side story, but when we were there 50 years after liberation, we were standing in the, the bathroom building and my mother said, I remember an, a, an oven over here. And my sisters and I were horrified. We were thinking ovens. What are she talking about? And we're in the bathroom. What? And the historian said, you're right. There was an, an oven over here. Why? Because the woman who was in charge, again, she wasn't a Nazi. She wasn't military. But she was in charge of the bathrooms, which was a horrible job. But because she agreed to do that job, she asked for special favors. She loved to bake. So she asked for an oven and they gave her an oven and she kept it in the bathroom and she would bake bread in there and give it to the Nazis when they, you know, came or whatever. They didn't, she didn't give it to the girls, but how odd. But that's to illustrate the point that, um, it, it, that even her Blokova was not a Nazi. It, she was not, she, she was not. We have a couple more. This one's a double question. Uh, did your mom find any surviving family? And the other question, the other part of that is how you were able to find those photographs of your mother, the young. <laughs> excellent, excellent question. Yes, my mother had two older brothers and they both survived. Was wonderful. It took a while to find them to be reunited. Um, one of her brothers, the one who was studying medicine at the Sorbonne, he um, immigrated to the United States. He lived in upstate New York and was a practicing ophthalmologist. We saw him um, a few times um, throughout the remainder of their lives. Her other brother was her best friend and they reunited. He immigrated to what then became Israel and we had not seen him for many, many years. In fact, it was my oldest sister's wedding. I was, I'm 12 years younger than my oldest sister and I was the flower girl at her wedding. And it was her wedding when my uncle Ozzy came from Israel to come to the wedding. It was the first time that the two of them had seen each other. It was a wonderful um, reuniting and it was on the front page of the Oregonian. Yeah, it was great. Can you speak to how you were able to cover the photographs? Oh, sorry. So you look through these book, the books and you say, how on earth did they have um, pictures, family photos? This is mom with her dog, Lily. These were um, relatives. And when there was nothing, nothing out of the town, there were 2000 Jews before the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, there were 200 who survived and only a handful of them actually came back to Sigat, Romania. The house, everything, somebody else had occupied the house. There was, there was nothing left. Um, my mother never returned until 50 years later. So how do you get these pictures? Well, now that I'm a mom, I understand because as a proud mother, her mom would send photographs to her friends and they mailed then now I'm texting my friends you know look what my son did but um, back then they mailed hard copies of photos and so my mom in time got uh, connected reconnected with family with friends of the family and when they found out that she was writing a book they said oh do you want some pictures <laughs> yes we want some pictures first time she had seen those pictures for, um, it was very special. Great question. We have three more. I'll cut it off okay. three. Um, how did they solve their language barrier, your parents? Which one of them learned to speak the other guy's language? <laughs> My mother learned German. And so, um, and then when they immigrated to the United States, they both learned English. Of course, one with a heavy German accent, the other with a heavy Hungarian accent. She sounded like Zsa Gabor when she spoke. But um, they never taught us their languages. I think they just wanted their girls to assimilate and they, they never taught us either of their languages or any of their languages. 
um, they would, but, but we could tell when they were talking about us, they would switch to German. <laughs> we could tell they were, we could hear our name or some word pop up that we recognized. How did you first learn her story from her herself? How did she tell really, you? Yeah, wonderful question. So the book came out when I was um, a young adult. I was in dental school at the time. Um, my three older sisters were already um, married at the time that the book came out in 1987. And we had heard bits and pieces of the story throughout our lives, but it wasn't until the book came out where we thought, oh, wow, that really went into a lot more detail and it helped us to understand some things, some different things about our mom. So it was really, it was at that point that, um, that, that I learned the, I'd say the full story. And then of course, from then I accompanied her to uh, many, many schools and churches, places where she talked and would hear her story over and over again. And every time she told it, I think I'm a little bit like her, every time she told it, different details would come through. So over the years, I was fortunate to hear much of her story. But it's very different than the experience that my um, other three sisters had as well, because we were so, I was so spread out in age between the oldest and the youngest of the four girls. My, my oldest sister was born only two years after my parents had emigrated in 1948, and she was born in 1950, so they were still learning the language. They didn't have, um, you know, much help with raising a child. They needed to learn a profession. They needed to learn how to support themselves. So her experience was very different um, than mine. Um, by the time I came, they were old hat at all of that stuff. And um, my, my mother became a little more open, I think, about sharing details. One story my oldest sister, um, um, my mother would tell about my oldest sister when she, when my sister was very young, she asked my mom, what are those numbers on your arm? She, of course, she had a tattoo of her numbers um, from, from the concentration camp. And my mom said, those, oh, don't worry about that. That's just Hitler's phone number. So she was always very age appropriate with us, which we now know is, was a good thing. Um, we hear of too many um, children of survivors who heard too many details early on and you just don't want to hear that your parents suffered like that you just you, when you're young you're already feeling vulnerable what if they're taken away again etc so my parents were always um, thankfully age appropriate with us so we learned little details would come out here and there but it wasn't until we were all adults when the book came out did she go back to Romania in the immediate post-war? And if so, can you tell us anything about her experience of anti-Semitism there? Was it oh, very good question. Other places? She didn't go back. She didn't go back. She was. She and my dad stayed in Sweden, and a family. Um, I, it was through a program, but it was like a foster family took them in and um, they got their papers in order and in two years immigrated to the United States. And she said the Swedish people were wonderful. She did not experience anti-Semitism. She didn't particularly experience anti-Semitism in her hometown growing up, not blatantly. It was just all so very strange that her lovely life that she described just was turned upside down for no fault of anything that she had or anyone had done. Um, in the, in um, growing up then, I grew up in Portland um, and she never described um, being um, discriminated against. I never experienced that, not blatantly, no. Um, we've had a wonderful life. Um, Portland, um, my mother was, was, she was a doer and a thinker. And she said, um, as the years went on, she said, we need to have a memorial, a Holocaust memorial here in Portland. 
because as survivors, we don't have a cemetery. We, there's no place we can go to be with our departed loved ones. You know, we, we, we miss that. And so let's build a memorial and have the names of our family members that were lost um, carved in the, in the granite wall and have it be, you know, an educational place to, uh, for, for people to come visit and learn about and remember. And it was a beautiful idea and it took um, 10 years for the city of Portland to build the memorial because there was opposition. There was op opposition. The city donated the land. They were so welcoming. They wanted the memorial, but some people didn't. So after 10 years um, of legal battles in and out of the courts, eventually um, the survivors and uh, others prevailed. And they have a beautiful memorial. If you ever get a chance to visit the memorial in Portland, please do so. It's in Washington Park there. And just as an aside, my mother also lived in Palm Desert, California um, in her later years and was uh, very successful in having a Holocaust Memorial established in their Memorial Park as well. Uh, I find that often a survivor had a, a, a message they would leave their audience with. Did your mom have one of those that you'd like to leave us with tonight? <laughs> Well, I think you can tell from some of the anecdotes that I described or some of the things that she used to say that she did have a very um, optimistic, um, sometimes humorous um, approach to things. And um, I know that she would say that that was important, but mostly she credited my father um, who, of course, knew her immediately upon her um, you know, recovery, and she, when when she was trying to make sense of this all and what just happened and her loss of her entire extended family, except for her brothers, she was angry, and she said, my father told her, don't be angry, because that anger will tear you up inside, and so she always had a, a positive, optimistic view, and she would tell the school children that she spoke to, church groups she spoke to, that she was very hopeful that, um, that, that, that this would not happen again. We have to remain vigilant to talk about what it was, why it happened, how it happened, because unfortunately, some of those things are still percolating the discrimination and um, this kind of thing. Um, and, and, and the government um, sponsoring such discrimination um, during her time is really a warning sign that she said, we just can't um, lose, lose sight of that. We have to be vigilant. But she also believes, believed that um, it won't happen again because people are good and people know better now and um, people would would help she was a very positive person positive outlook on life thank you jerry thank you for representing second generation speakers bureau tonight and sharing yes, yes absolutely i um i wish everybody um safety and health during these challenging times and um to come out um even better than before. Thank you all for joining us. We hope this has been meaningful to you and that you are able to take something from Jerry's, uh, Jerry and her mom's story uh, forward with you. Thank you, have a wonderful night and we'll see you next time.